We're here with Humboldt County Health Officer Dr. Teresa Frankovich for the July 29th media availability. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. And would you like to start off by sharing with us anything surrounding the case rates that you feel pertinent to the community? Sure. So, you know, one thing I did want to talk about a little bit is I know I've been repeating often about our concerns about, uh, you know, gatherings and travel as being a source of a lot of our infections lately. And in particular, the combination of the two. So it's our residents going away and meeting up with friends and family in other areas. And it's um, our local residents inviting family and friends here to visit and gathering. I, you know, I've, I've mentioned repeatedly that travel introduces risk. And what I wanted to do is just kind of give people an idea about how much risk that represents. So if we look, when we pull, um, we look at some of the data from areas across the state, what we see is that if you're thinking about traveling to the Bay Area, for example, um, you know, San Francisco, Alameda, Santa Clara, Marin, San Mateo, those counties, they are reporting COVID-19 rates that are about four to nine times what we're seeing here in Humboldt. If we look at Sacramento County, their rates are about six times what we're seeing here locally. Los Angeles, San Bernardino, Riverside in Southern California, those are COVID-19 rates about nine to 14 times Humboldt County. And when we look at the Central Valley, which is struggling right now with a lot of COVID disease, Kern, Merced, Kings County, um, and I believe Stanislaus County as well is reporting high rates. They're reporting rates 11 to 20 times what we're seeing here in Humboldt. And so it's just a really important consideration for people. You know, I, I realize it sometimes feels like I'm just going to visit my mom and dad or my sister down in, you know, Kearns County. The problem is, is that the likelihood of you encountering someone who's ill in that visit is much higher than it is locally if you're out and about in the community and the likelihood that a family member or friend that you're visiting has been exposed and may become ill in the next you know couple days is much higher and by the same token when you bring people in from those areas you introduce the possibility of more virus in our community so this is a time where people really across our state across our country should be staying closer to home and not increasing transmission from where they are. And so I'd just like people to consider that when they're thinking about those short trips that they may want to do right now, but if they're not essential, it's really not the time to do it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We'll get into the questions from the media. Nearly 100 residents of the isolated community of Shelter Cove were tested for COVID-19 on Monday. What protocols would be set in place if a large percentage of those tests can't come back positive? So we would follow the same sort of protocol that we do with all cases. So we, if we get positive results back from that group, we will look at those positives. We'll reach out to every positive. We will talk with them. We will find out where they've been, what their exposures might be, who their contacts are. And then we will widen our case investigation from that point. Anyone identified as positive would be in isolation and um, their close contacts would be in quarantine. Obviously, if we have a large number all at one time, it's a big influx of work all at one time. And so it's a huge demand on our staffing resources to respond to these things. So again, Large gatherings, um, large mixing within an area can create a really difficult um, challenge in terms of containing spread in our community. Yesterday, the county announced that they would be tripling testing capacity here locally with a machine that would allow you to run up to 250 test samples a day. With current issues regarding testing availability, scheduling an appointment, staffing issues, etc. Will it be, even be possible for public health to collect that many samples each day? How will this new testing capacity impact testing turnaround time? Sure. So, I mean, there are really two separate kind of testing ideas here. One is the testing we do internally, which we are not collecting. Um, we have the various clinics, hospitals, sometimes congregate settings, all basically doing specimen collection and submitting them to public health. We use couriers to get those specimens back to our lab. 
Um, and then we have to process them here and report out on those specimens. The new equipment basically allows us to go from a max of about 85 to 100 or so, maybe a little more specimens per day to, you know, more like 250 to 300 specimens when we have it fully engaged. So we would just be able to accept more specimens from all of these other pieces and from some of the um, places where we're helping with surveillance because they're high risk settings, it will help us accommodate those samples in a timely way. Our turnaround time with our lab is, a, you know, we expect to remain the same, which is 24 to 72 hours on a turnaround. So it, our hope is that we'll be able to test symptomatic people um, within our lab for a quick turnaround and that we will be able to test the contacts of our cases and that we'll be able to help with certain high risk um, settings as well. Um, we, in addition, we need a large um, sort of collection um, and testing capacity like we have had with Optum. Um, and we don't know that Optum will be our solution to that after the end of August. And so we are looking and working on building an alternative to that that would allow us to do the large scale surveillance testing we really need in our community and the ability to get a good enough turnaround time that we can also use that for people who are ill down the road. Um, so really it's just this plan to get as robust testing responsiveness as we can within our county. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And this might be similar to the last question. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, it was announced that Humboldt County has tripled its testing capacity. Does this mean the turnaround time for test results will be quicker? If so, by how many days? So again, I just want to mention that that tripling is really um, our internal lab capacity. Our overall capacity across the county includes our Optum site, you know, our hospital and clinic-based testing that occurs now and is much, um, much bigger than what we can do internally. So, um, you know, again, the turnaround time for our own lab will be, we expect to be the same. The turnaround time for Optum remains the same right now, which is longer than we want it to be. And so again, that's why we're working to construct a solution that will give us a better turnaround time that makes it more useful in the long haul. Thank you. All it takes for the alert level to rise is one factor and the spread of illness is, current, is presently at three. What is the metric that shifts moderately high burden to high burden, increasing spread to widespread transmission, and some outbreaks to many outbreaks? Sure, so you know, when we post the alert level, it really goes to those different components that we're looking at. You know, do we, what are we seeing in terms of our case counts? What are we seeing in terms of our ability to do contact investigations and isolation and quarantine and contain spread? And then what is what does our hospital capacity look like? So those are the so three segments that inform that chart. And then the rule is when you're using these is that the, the highest level dictates the overall status for the county. Um, and so in this instance, we have been at that level three or orange level because of our case rate um, that is, you know, basically been increasing um, in recent weeks and is now exceeds the 25 per 100,000 um, to is now sitting closer in that 30 range. Um, but we use multiple metrics to inform each of these categories. And so it's no one single measure that always um, dictates um, in many categories, things like are we seeing infections in healthcare workers in addition to what are our hospital bed capacity look like? Are we seeing, um, are not only do we have robust contact tracing teams, but do we have large events that are happening or large outbreaks, or are we having difficulty identifying contacts in investigations? All of these things can help inform the levels. And so um, it really isn't typically one particular indicator in most of these um, categories. It's really multiple things that drive the whole system. Thank you. Now at level three, at what point will Humboldt County have to roll back on reopening? So I think the, the point about level three is that we're really saying to people, we're seeing a uh, really um, a clear increase in the amount of transmission in our community. We are seeing that the risk is increasing for exposure in our community. And we're asking people to do all of those measures that we've talked about, um, in particular, trying to limit, you know, their, their, their activities, certainly outside the county, but even within, you know, we've been asking people all along to be doing what they need to do 
but not just, you know, really doing a lot of roaming about. Um, because we know that the more people stay separated, the harder it is for the disease to, to spread. Um, we're continuing to ask people to use facial coverings. The, again, the evidence is mounting about the, the ability for them to help stem the spread of infection. And so I really can't emphasize that enough. The distancing, the hand washing, the sanitizing, the not gathering, all of those pieces are just get increasingly important as our disease activity increases. And so, you know, do I, at this point, neither the state nor us locally are stepping back into full shelter in place. Our goal is to do all of the preventive measures we can so that does not become necessary. However, um, if we begin to see um, just a rapid escalation more than we have been in our cases and we start to see impacts on things like our ability to do significant impacts on our ability to do contact investigations, compromise of our testing, compromise of our healthcare capacity in some way, those things are the kinds of things that would force us to look at the issue and whether we do need to step back. And finally, I would say that again, being placed on the county monitoring list would put us in a position where we would have to step back and move to outdoor only for segments of our economy and activities such as fitness facilities and when we look at, you know, hair salons and barber shops and personal care services, worship services, those would all have to move outdoors only. And so we're watching all of that. Thank you. On the new county dashboard, can you explain what the epidemiological curve by episode graph slash data represents? And what does this data mean in comparison to our total case count? that is documented each day. How do both numbers depict the spread of the virus in Humboldt County? So, you know, we basically present the data in a couple different ways. We every day give a case count and that's based on all the cases that we, um, any positive cases that we see from our local lab right away, um, as well as the cases that are identified in the state system, the surveillance system. So those, any positives coming in um, through any venue, local hospitals running a test, us running a test, the commercial available in the state surveillance system, that all gets put into our daily report of positives. And we put it by the date, um, you know, by the, it's assigned in terms of when that test result is available. The episode, um, the epidemiological curve by episode graph really is um, just a different way to display the data. So when our epidemiologist goes through and looks at cases, on the first day that we have the case, we don't necessarily know what day their symptoms started. We know what day they tested positive. And so sometimes this graph will look a little bit different because from an epidemiologic convention, um, our person will go in and look at, as we learn more about the cases, when did the symptoms, what's the earliest date we can identify that this patient had the infection? And we look at their symptom onset, um, their, um, when the disease report came into us, lab confirmation, or a lab test date. So we look at all those factors, whatever's the earliest date we find in there is the date we assign it. And that's what you see in that particular curve. It's just a different way to look at the pattern of cases that we're seeing. According to the Humboldt County dashboard, 0% of our Black community members have tested positive for the virus. Is that true? Can you speculate as to why? So I would point out that, you know, we are reporting the data that we have. So um, if someone identifies as um, Black on our, our um, intake, then that is what we would report. So, you know, a zero in there means we have not had that reported. What I would say, though, is if people look at that table, there's a large percent of people for which we do not have I, that data. We just don't have either. Um, it's been, you know, the person was tested elsewhere that wasn't collected at the outset. We have not yet collected that data. Oftentimes, these are areas on the forms that are not completed. Um, and sometimes people just aren't interested in giving us that information. So, you know, there may be um, residents in our community who are not identified on this table simply because we don't have the data available to us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. With the city of Eureka using social media to invite tourists to the area and an upcoming street art festival with out-of-area artists, are the county and Dr. Frankovich now welcoming visitors to Humboldt County? 
previously, tourism was discouraged. How is this different from having traveling sports teams coming? So, um, sometimes I feel a bit like a broken record, <laughs> but what I would say again is my intent is that people don't travel distances. They just don't. That we enjoy these things locally and we do not bring people in to enjoy them and we do not travel out to other areas to enjoy what they're offering. Right now is just not the time for travel. Um, I appreciate when things occur in our community like this that you know there's a lot of messaging perhaps about you know, masking and distancing and all of those things. Um, and I think, you know, it's just really, it's just not the optimal time to be doing a lot of these activities and certainly not in terms of inviting people from outside our community to come in. Yesterday, the Fortuna Unified High School District Board, with the support of a survey where 55% of parents agreed, voted to resume in-person classes against the recommendation of the teachers union. Can you speak to your con to concerns, if any, and recommendations you would make if asked? What are some strategies that could be utilized to mitigate viral transmission if they return in person as planned? Sure. So again, you know, from a public health standpoint, um, you know, I think we, in addition to the schools, recognize the intrinsic value of children being in school to learn, you know, both because it's an optimal learning environment and because they gain a lot of other supports and such by being in school. That being said, it's obviously a challenging time to put kids in school um, because a lot of sort of infrastructure has to change to accommodate safety measures and such that need to be in place. So we've been supportive in terms of public health, both at the state and local level of saying, you know, you need, here are the recommendations for how to structure your environment. Each school is unique into how well they're able to incorporate those or able to incorporate those. And so every school's decision and every community's decision may be different about what they offer in terms of school. And we support them doing what they feel will accommodate the needs of their community best and will accommodate the safety requirements that are needed to be in place. So, um, you know, obviously Fortuna uh, made the vote to begin. Um, I think that, um, you know, it, it, there, there are certainly challenges that we're going to face with this, um, but I think what we do have to recognize as a community is that there are costs to what to being in school, there are costs to not having our children in school, to families, to children, to all of us in the community. And so I think our obligation, knowing that there is no completely safe path forward, is to try and proceed in the best interest as best we can of most of our members. And so I think as a pediatrician, I think kids should be in school. I think that that may not be possible for an entire school year, I think that it may not be possible in every school. And so I think that if Fortuna feels they're able to implement all the guidelines well, and that they're able to structure um, that environment to help um, keep teachers and students and everyone as safe as possible, knowing nothing is gonna prevent all spread of COVID in any environment, you know, it's just going to happen in our community. Um, there, the, all those pieces in place, then you know, we will work on the public health side to support that decision. I think in terms of mitigation in the school, again, um, having robust planning around this, um, we've worked with them in terms of providing public health guidance that supports state and Academy of Pediatrics guidance. We will work with them on contact investigations when cases occur. Um, and we will, we're really working with trying to restructure our testing to be able to support some ongoing surveillance testing um, for school staff as well. So all of these measures are pieces that we can help to work with the schools on to create a, a safer environment over this year. All the schools recognize that right now we're not on the county monitoring list. We're able to open. However, if that changes before the start of the school year, um, then plans may shift. And if we get into trouble with numbers, transmission during the school year, schools may need to pull back to a distance model who are currently planning on operating in person. It's gonna be challenging over the year, and I understand that for families. Um, but I think the fact that schools are able to accommodate at this point, um, the, these in Fortuna, 
the families who do want their kids in school, as well as families who may choose distance learning, um, that the fact that they can accommodate both of those things is, is good. Thank you. And finally, if you can, what does current science offer that speaks to the effects of not attending school will have on children and on the essential workforce? Uh, well, I think that's, you know, again, it's one of those considerations that we were talking about is there's cost to both paths forward. You know, not putting in school means there are some kids who are not going to be in a learning environment that is going to work for them. Um, you know, optimally, it means that there are some kids who won't get support services that they might otherwise get if school were open. It means some families are going to have challenges in terms of structuring child care. Um, so there are there's certainly um, challenges that um, that occur if kids are not able to be on site in school. And so I think that, you know, it, it's a difficult decision to make. And I think that, again, each school just has to balance their ability to construct, you know, the environment according to the guidances available and what they can offer for the families in their community and what the families are asking for, frankly. Okay. How can one safely care for an elderly COVID patient who is released from hospital care and advised to isolate at home? So, I'm assuming, I'm assuming this relates to a, like a family member, um, perhaps, who is released and advised to isolate at home. Um, I think that, you know, obviously an elderly person is more vulnerable to severe disease with COVID. Um, and so it, you know, my assumption is that if they're released from hospital care and sent home, it's because they're clinically doing well enough to be at home. Um, Generally speaking, there's discharge planning when people leave the hospital. And so plans are put in, uh, you know, sort of what's needed is put in place before people leave, ideally, so that we make sure that there's someone in the home who can assist if that's what's needed or somebody monitoring that patient in some way on a regular basis to make sure that they're still doing well. Um, and then any supports that they need in terms of medication, food, monitoring are there. Um, and so I think, you know, it's obviously people would prefer to be at their home if at all possible, but we do want to, you know, do good planning so that people are safe to return to that home environment. Thank you. Can a person negative for COVID be in the same household as someone positive for COVID? How? Well, it's a really good question. You know, I think in the best of all worlds, uh, we would be able to say if you test positive for COVID, um, you know, if you can be out, you know, isolate yourself from everyone um, for 10 days or so, um, that that would be optimal in terms of decreasing transmission. Practically speaking, um, that is typically not what people would choose to do. They want to be at home. And oftentimes home includes other people. So what we encourage people to do is to try and isolate as much as possible from other family members within their home. So in the best circumstances, you're able to be, say, in a bedroom by yourself, um, and that if you use shared restroom facilities, those are cleaned every time they're used, um, that someone brings food to, say, the door of your bedroom, that you are able to eat, and that um, you know, everyone in the household is able to stay separate from you so that um, there's decreased risk of transmission in the home. And we've actually seen that be successful in the home with um, few family members or no family members um, getting secondary infections. In reality, however, some homes are crowded and it's difficult to socially distance and people do want to still be together. And so in that instance, um, we encourage people to mask if they're outside of say a bedroom um, to use lots of hand washing, sanitizing, um, to ask family members to mask around them, distance, and just do all those prevention measures inside the home. Those family members who are not isolated from the case are, you know, we have to be in quarantine, not only while that person is infectious, um, but for 14 days after that infectious period. So it is a big commitment on the part of the family. Um, and the idea of that, of course, is to reduce spread outside that home. What about traveling to take care of loved ones, i.e. the hospital says they are going to release my grandparent from the hospital to self-isolate at home, but she doesn't have a caregiver, no one to administer meds, pick up prescriptions, get her food, 
groceries, etc. So what happens when there are no nearby relatives to help a patient? Can a loved one travel to her county to take care of her? And how could that put the loved one's community at risk upon their return? Wondering how you might advise in this scenario. Sure. So, you know, again, I, I think in this particular scenario, of course, if my mom were ill and there was no one nearby to help take care of her, I would want to go there and take care of her. And I would consider that essential travel to provide for the medical care of a family member who needs you. Um, I think there, what we would say is that you want to do it as safely po as possible, which means you're as safe as possible when you're traveling, meaning you're using facial coverings and you are doing all the things we talk about in terms of prevention measures, um, that when you arrive to take care of that person, um, because you are introducing even you know, some, um, some risk to that person because you're coming from somewhere else, um, that you, know, you use facial coverings, that you use good hand washing, that you monitor yourself for symptoms to make sure that you are not ill. Um, and then basically upon your return, um, if you're coming from an area with a lot of transmission of COVID, if you have been out and about, um, if you have not been using prevention measures in that community in particular, um, then I think, you know, you need to think about quarantining yourself when you return for 14 days. And I think that can be um, helpful in terms of protecting the community around you. Um, and if you're not able to quarantine upon your return, then self-monitoring very carefully for symptoms and trying, making sure that you're using masking and distancing and all those things so that if you do become ill, you are not exposing other individuals. Do masks slash facial coverings improve respiratory conditions at all when wildfire smoke is present? So it, basically the, the vast majority of us are using cloth masks and those really aren't felt to be a protective measure against smoke. It just doesn't have that kind of filtering ability um, it's typically more N95 or the higher level mask that, for instance, our healthcare workers use um, for COVID protection that would be useful in that instance. Um, most people um, don't particularly enjoy wearing N95 masks for prolonged periods of time, but those are the types of masks that are used in those instances, particularly for people, you know, especially vulnerable. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Has anybody been exposed or contracted COVID-19 at any places of worship in Humboldt County? So I would tell you that we're not aware of any outbreaks related to a, a, a place of worship in our county. Um, you know, as we see community transmission grow, um, oftentimes people are not able to identify a setting that they're in. Um, and so we do, we do prompt on some of these things when we're asking, you know, where have you been in the last, you know, two, you know, like, you know, two or three days before you became ill? What kind of exposures have you had? Um, but, you know, right now, again, no outbreaks that we're aware of connected to a place of worship. Um, but my assumption is that as the level of disease increases in our community, that these joint gathering places are going to be spaces in which people, um, particularly people who don't yet have symptoms, are able to spread disease. Because they just, you know, obviously most of us would not go to church or wherever if they knew they were ill. But a lot of these exposures happen before people are aware. Yes, thank you. Are health officials monitoring places of worship differently than other places that are certified to be open? Well, um, places of worship are uh, slightly different in that they did, were not required um, to submit a written plan um, to us. Um, we have done a lot of outreach um, with the faith-based community about planning and about what the recommendations are. And I know these entities do have those recommendations. We've asked them to you know, really work hard on adhering to them because it is a really significant potential exposure setting for individuals. And as we know, if we go onto the county monitoring list, places of worship will have to move outdoors. My recommendation is it's a better place to be right now anyway. Um, and fortunately, you know, many places in our county are not particularly harsh in terms of weather right now, at least in the coastal areas. So being outdoors is not as difficult, um, you know, because of heat and such. Um, but really the safest place for people, if they are going to come together for worship, is to do so outdoors. How big is the contact tracing team for Humboldt County? Well, we've been, we've been building our team for quite some time. I would say that we have about 
40 people or so who are fully trained to participate in contact investigation. Um, we have additional individuals, uh, probably another 30 or so, who have sort of been identified in various places in terms of training um, and being able to step in. Um, that being said, a lot of these folks that we have on board are um, work in other capacities um, within the county or um, you know, other places. Some are actually volunteers that have stepped forward to be participants in this as well. And so we use them. They're not all full-time employees. We pull them in as needed um, for our case investigations. And so we depend upon some flexibility um, in their original place of work to be able to do that. Um, but uh, we have quite a few individuals working right now, but we do have still have some have capacity to pull people in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Publications such as Forbes have released articles that claim that cannabis helps prevent and treat COVID-19. Can you share what you know about the virus and marijuana? Well, and you know, I noted the Forbes piece. Um, the you know, right now, there's really not much known. Um, I think some of this goes to the point of sort of the um, angiotensin converting enzyme to AC, it's ACE or ACE2. Um, it's a protein that cells in the lungs and kidneys, for example, have. There's um, theoretical um, ideas about whether cannabis and impact on those proteins might help to have a preventative effect. Um, but my understanding is most of the re most of the look at this right now is still more theoretical than it is actual um, research based, and so um, yeah, I'm sure there are going to be a lot of studies coming out looking at this and you know looking at all of the possible treatment or prevention modalities that we can find. So you know I'll be happy to chime in as more comes out. But right now, um, you know a lot of it has been more um, thought based rather than actual research based. And we'll be following that as well as we look at every other modality as we go. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Frankovich. Mm -hmm. Thank you.